How come that all modern two-stroke dirt bikes have water cooling, but we see it so rarely in the paramotor world? Are we doing something wrong? Welcome to the paramotor geometry classroom. We are shooting some update chapters because you asked for this information. You don't get power without the heat. That's the principle of the combustion engines. And the source of the heat is right here, right underneath the cylinder head. So the cylinder head is probably the hottest part of the engine. Then the cylinder, of course, gets a lot of heat exposure, gets cooled by these ribs, just as the cylinder head. And the piston, obviously, gets a lot of heat. And the piston is actually cooled from the bottom as the cool air comes in and cools the piston from, uh, from the bottom. If cooling is so crucial, if cooling doesn't allow us to use the most efficient settings, those the most powerful settings of the carburetor, why don't we just use water cooling? Why just we don't use more cooling? Let's get into it. So basically we have three options. Propeller cooling, that's basically just a bunch of ribs on the cylinder head and cylinder and you have airflow around it. That airflow is primarily generated by the propeller. Then we have forced cooling, that's basically the whole engine is enclosed in a plastic or carbon fiber case. Uh, you don't see it on the picture, but there is a little fan on the other side that is connected to the shaft. So the fan is spinning, creating airflow. So this engine doesn't rely on the airflow generated by the prop. It generates its own. And obviously water cooling, as mentioned, this is the solution used for uh, older bikes, but very rarely on the paramotors. Why is it so? Weight and simplicity. So when you design a paramotor engine or a paramotor frame, as I'm a frame designer, you want to start with the minimum necessary. And then you do tests. And if it's not enough, you add a little bit on top of it and add a little bit on top of it. But you start with the minimum. And the minimum is this one, prop cooling. Let's get into it. Propeller cooling is very simple. There aren't any parts, they are just ribs, and the ribs can't break, it's just there. It's cheap, less parts, it's cheaper. It's light, less parts, it's lighter. It's very compact because there is nothing on top of it. It's very shallow because it's just, you know, the engine, the pulley in front of it, and the, and the depth of the engine is very shallow. It's lighter on your back, you have less gyroscopic effect. Please refer to chapters 22.1 and chapter 17 of this uh, geometry classroom. I'll explain these in those chapters. Is less efficient? Yes. So this is how you start to design an engine. Try the simplest thing, test it if it's enough. If it's not enough, then you need to make improvements. The major improvements mostly that we mostly see with these engines is add a cooling shroud and fins on the prop. Now, the, what a cooling shroud is, a cooling shroud is kind of a mostly carbon fiber shroud around uh, the cylinder head and the top side of, uh, of the cylinder that forces the air to blow, uh, to flow very close to the ribs or in between the ribs. It's wider or uh, on the suction side, on the propeller side. So it sucks, so the propeller, as it spins, it sucks air from a larger surface and, and, and that air is forced to flow on a very narrow gap around this. So it increases the airflow at the cylinder head and the top side of the cylinder. Adding cooling fins, you know these propellers uh, have kind of an enlarged center part of the prop where you, uh, where you have additional like a cooling fin. That fin is, is stupid in terms of propeller design. It's, it's inefficient in terms of creating thrust. It's just necessary to create, to add a little bit more airflow in that area. My experience when we did some testing was that the, the cooling shroud cools the engine, like decreases the, C, the cylinder head temperature by about 20, 25 degrees. The cooling fins do about the same and together they do about 35 degrees difference. That's a lot. That's a pretty, pretty good result for cooling. In most cases, it's sufficient. So I myself, as a personal engine, I fly the Vitarazzi Monster Plus 
but many many other brands use the same system because it's simple cheap light and 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 sufficient why do we see that small engines don't have this cooling system small small engines i'm talking about 80 cc 100 cc engines they have forced cooling why are they different there are numerous reasons for that first let's set the goals for a small engine light lighter and lightest that's the point that's why they you know shrink the whole engine to 80 cc they want them to be compact the customers want them to be compact and light but most pilots that fly a top 80 or an atom 80 engine are super happy with those engines but i've never heard them say no i don't wish for more power so the designer wants to squeeze the most juice of that limited uh, cc engine that's why they rely on high rpm as they want to squeeze the most power of it, they rely on gear reduction instead of belt reduction because gear reduction is a bit more efficient. Now, it comes as a cost. Higher RPM generates more heat. So in this area, the prop cooling wouldn't be sucking enough air because it's just way too close. The further you go from the uh, center of the prop, the more airflow you generate and then it decreases at the tips. We discussed that previously. So these are the implications for small engines. You get a bit more heat because of high RPM and you don't get enough airflow generated by the prop because you're very close to the center of the propeller. That means you need to improve the system. The existing system is relying on a cooling shroud and prop generated airflow. You now you need to improve that and the simplest way to improve that is forced cooling. Now, basically, these are the parts for, uh, for the Atom 80 forced cooling. This is a plastic case that encloses the whole engine. This is basically an improved cooling shroud. So it forces the air to flow directly and very tightly and closely on around the cylinder head and the cylinder. And this is the replacement of the fins on the propeller. So this is the fan attached directly on the shaft on the backside of the engine, generated airflow, blowing it through, through this little gap in the, in the shroud. So it's basically the same principle, just made better. Now, what are the disadvantages? Complexity. It's more complex, more parts, more, more things to break eventually. And the major problem is that it's just deeper because you have the engine and then you add additional fan which which has some depth it's pretty big so the overall depth of the engine increases and the en engine becomes more bulky now let's talk about big fat powerful engines why don't we just use forced cooling forced cooling on big engines when an engineer is designing a big fat powerful engine for power motor use what are the goals power more power and and, and the most power you can get these engines are mostly used for trikes and slalom racing and both trikes and slalom racing, you just want the most power possible to get out of that limited uh, 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 CC of, the, of that engine. Weight is not a primary goal. If you ask any slalom pilot, he would say, yeah, I would love to have, I would love the Polini 250 to be a little lighter, but you know, I don't want to sacrifice power. I want more power. They would even probably accept a little bit more weight if they get additional free horsepower. Same with the trikes. I mean, does it matter with a double-seater tandem trike that the engine weights two or four kilos more or less? No, not really, because you already have over two, probably 200 kilos of, of passengers and another 50 kilos of the trike itself. So two, three kilos don't really matter. So the goal is to have maximum power. The maximum power you can get is high RPM, compression ratio, and so on. And you need to cool it down. So this is how the big, so the, the big bore engines for, uh, for trikes and slalom racing rely on water cooling just as, they, as the dirt bikes do. Actually, when preparing this presentation, it was very interesting to see how how engine designers follow pretty much the same patterns. So, so small engines, force cooling, mid-range engines, air cooling, large engines, water cooling. But there is another interesting, like a bonus topic. So if you have on a Viterati Monster roughly 200 degrees up here and 200, uh, 120 in the crankcase, that's where the air goes in, mixes with fuel and oil, and 
comes to an area of about the temperature of 120. And this is the crucial temperature. This is the crucial temperature in terms of selecting the right oil. Some two-stroke oils actually evaporate at this temperature. They boil and these little droplets created by the carburetor convert to gas. Gas doesn't lubricate. I discussed this with Matteo, uh, the designer of the Vitorazzi engines, uh, a few years ago, and he explained to me why it is sufficient to use 1.5% of Motul 800 oil instead of 2.5% of other oils, simply because at the temperature of 120, some other oils simply boil and they turn to gas. So these little droplets of, of uh, fuel and oil they evaporate, turn to gas, and gas doesn't lubricate. You need to keep the oil in the liquid form. And Motul 800 has higher boiling temperature. That's why it, most of it remains in the form of, of liquid droplets and continues to lubricate very nicely. Right now, we are shooting some update videos uh, for our Paramotor Geometry Classroom series. This time, we discuss engine aspects and let the next topic be positioning of the engine mounts. It's interesting to see that the most engine designers actually make it the wrong way. Stay with us, hit the subscribe button. If you have any suggestions for next topics, please leave a comment or send us a message. We will cover that. Thank you very much and see you soon.